Okay, so let me see how many people. All right. So let me give the confounding variables basically we normally say that both extraneous and um, confounding variables, they are quite related in that regard, okay? So we can say the confounding variable is the bigger umbrella than also we have extraneous. But one key difference is that confounding, it could be that, um, let me use um, a typical example. For instance, the example that I use, whereby I said we want to find how caffeine affects mood how caffeine affects mood you can see that um bravo x which is caffeine typically affects bravo y which is mood we can have a third variable which could also have significant influence or could also um be a third variable or a third could be a second let me say a second iv Last room temperature. Room temperature could also affect mood, right? So that's a typical extraneous variable because the room temperature is having a direct effect on our dependent variable. But with confounding variable, it could be that um, that variable has nothing to do with it affecting mood. But to some extent, it is having a significant um, impact on the study that we are doing. It is having a significant impact on the study that we are doing. It could be maybe um, light. Light has nothing, ha light has no direct effect on what? Oh, I think light even has, I'm missing light has, okay, because some people, when they are in bright light and all that, it could affect their mood. So light could also have an effect. So it could be something which has nothing to do with um, mood. A variable which has nothing to do with mood. Then we could see, say, oh, per our analysis, that thing had significant influence on the study. So out of it, we are saying it is confounding the study in that regard. That's a typical confounding variable. So it means confounding variable in most situations, it has nothing to do with, um, it, it has no direct effect on our dependent variable, but to some extent, it influences our study, or it could influence our study. So it means we have to reduce it. And in, in most situations, confounding variables are difficult for, they are quite difficult for research, researchers to um, reduce because whenever you are um, trying to reduce or eliminate any study, any um, variables which could have influence on your study. Your focus is on this extraneous variables. The variables that you know that it could have direct impact on the thing that you are measuring. But we ignore certain confounding variables which could affect our study. Because to in our mind, it wouldn't cross our mind to let us know that, okay, this variable could affect our study. But at the end of the study, it confounds it. And we have certain techniques that we can use to standardize these confounding variables. But with time, um, in subsequent um, lessons, we will learn more about it, how to reduce those things when we are not able to predict our confounding variables. Okay. So okay, some more, your hand is still up. I don't know whether it's by mistake or... No, yeah, I want to ask a question. Okay. Please. Could you go over the, the variable, the situational and the mediating variable? What, what is their difference? No, Samuel, I wouldn't go over because um, if I do that, time will delay. So what I've done is that I have already, um, I'm recording, I'm recording whatever I'm, I'm saying. So after 
the lesson, I would upload it so that you can have a, a fair idea about what I, I said. That would be much better. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. All right. So any other clarification? Moses. That's it. If, if I understand um, uh, what you are saying, uh, then what, uh, what I'm understanding now is uh, no matter how the experiment is being conducted, you still have some kind of uh, influences on the outcome. Yes, it, even, that it doesn't have, it will not uh, be eliminated uh, yes. Uh, completely. Yes. In experiments, no matter even with extraneous variables, it's not every variable that, that will come to your mind for you to reduce. There are, there are instances whereby you have confounding and extraneous variables in your study. But there are key things that you should know. That's why I don't want to go there, but we have something known as a control group. You're supposed to make sure that there's a control group so that the effect um, that it will have on your experimental group will be the same as your control group because you can't control everything. So that's why in any experiment, we normally say that you using more than one groups is much more desirable so that we can test it well. So we'll come to that, how, how, how to do it. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Okay, so session three. I'm done with session three. So we are moving on to session um four. Let me try and get this. Yeah. So uh, the next one will be um, experimental research. So one thing about experiment is that in conducting any experiment, we try to manipulate the independent variable. Then after it has been manipulated, we control certain variables. That's especially we control extraneous variables. Then after it has been controlled, then we measure the effect of what? Of the dependent variable. That's a typical research work. So in, in research work, that's how we do it. We first manipulate our IV, then try to standardize or reduce extraneous variables. Then we measure the effect of the dependent variable on our independent variable. So, in conducting any ex experiment, you are supposed to make sure that there is a control group. So in risk in experiment, always it is much more desirable for you to have an experimental group and a control group. So we normally say that when you have these two groups, we call it true experiment. So in any true experiment, you're supposed to have a control group and an experimental group. So one would ask, what's the different, what does it mean for you to say control group and experimental group? So we, we normally say that experimental group, they are the ones that receive the treatment in the experiment. So when I say treatment, it means they are the ones that receive the independent variable. So for instance, the previous study that I indicated, how caffeine affects mood. So let's say the mood that we are measuring is um, anxiety. So we want to find out how caffeine influence anxiety. So you remember I said the independent variable, which is caffeine, we can divide it into, or yes, we can manipulate it or change it into different um, levels. So let's say I, sampled five participants or sorry six participants three of the participants i gave them one cup of caffeine 
Then the other three, I gave them two cups of caffeine. So it means the groups, these two groups, that's I gave them caffeine, they are all experimental group. Then an, another group, I sampled another additional three groups. And this additional three groups, I didn't give them any caffeine, but rather I gave them water. Or maybe a substance which tastes like um, caffeine, but it doesn't co contain any caffeine co content. I think um, in most, um, I I've forgotten the um, name for it, that they, they know, or the term for it. So when you go to um, the Western countries, when you go to um, most of the bars and everything, they have certain drinks which taste like caffeine, but it, it is not a caffeine in that regard, and they have a name for it. So let's say I gave some um, that, subst that substance to uh, my participants. So it means one of the participants, I give them caffeine, the other participants or the other group, I didn't give them caffeine. So the participants that receive caffeine, they are the ones known as the experimental group because they are the ones receiving the treatment. When I say the treatment, I mean the IV. They are the ones that receive the independent variable. Then the ones that didn't receive the independent variable, no caffeine, or maybe something that is like caffeine but doesn't have any caffeine content. They are the ones referred to as the control group. So in most situations, those who didn't receive caffeine but a different substance that tastes like caffeine, that substance that we normally use is what is referred to as the placebo. Placebo. Why do we normally use, so can anyone give me a clue as to why we normally use placebo for the, those in um, the control group? Any rationale behind us using a placebo in that regard? Any clue? Vivian. Hello, sir. Could it be that so that they don't act as if they are also being given um, the IV? Can, can you repeat what you said? I'm saying that they are, maybe I'm thinking that they are giving the placebo so that they don't um, they don't act as if um, they are fine, so that they also be playing along. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Nice try. Isra? Um, sir, the placebo is given so they can have the placebo effect. This is where psychologically the person thinks that he or she is being given the actual treatment. Uh -huh. so but then it's not so being given so the treatment. Yes, I get it. So, so why this, do you think this... why? Why 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 do you think we we um give them the placebo the placebo? For them to believe that okay they are being given the actual treatment why why do you think it's, it's really essential that's my question oh. sir all right please go ahead someone listen go ahead sir. yes sir. sir i think it's meant for deception okay yes okay one thing is listen i, I get wh where you're coming from one thing is okay with the placebo effect that um, Vivian indicated, we don't want an instance whereby um, the participants in the control group, they will feel like, okay, they were not given anything at all, or else it could lead to what I normally say, demand characteristics. They could easily guess the outlook of the study or the hypothesis of the study. Okay, when I realized that ah, some of the participants they were giving caffe caffeine by me. I was giving maybe water or no caffeine at all. I wasn't giving any substance. They could easily guess that mm, these researchers, they are trying to what they are trying to find out how caffeine to some extent influences us. So in order to what in order to prevent 
the researchers from guessing the hypothesis of the study, which is demand characteristics. Researchers, to some extent, will give them a substance which tastes like caffeine, so that participants in both groups wouldn't know what truly they are trying to measure or the, the rationale behind, behind it. So that's, that's, the, that's the essence. So to some extent, yes, it is a form of deception that they are using because they are withholding one or two information. So that's why at the end, it is really essential for researchers to, to debrief them. All right. So in research work, especially if you are conducting an experiment, it is one of the key things. You are supposed to make sure that there's a control group so that at the end of the day, you can easily know whether um, the treatment that um, the other groups had really worked or not. That's the essence of a control group. So if, for instance, you didn't, uh, you didn't um, provide any control group, you just um, gave them caffeine. You wouldn't know whether it is caffeine which is causing people to have anxiety or not. But in an instance whereby you have a control group that were not given um, any caffeine and another group that were given caffeine. And here comes the case, those in um, the experimental group, that's those who receive the caffeine, their anxiety is, is high, and those in the control group, the anxiety is low. Then you can say for sure that, oh, caffeine is the one causing anxiety. But in an instance whereby you don't have any control group, then you wouldn't know for sure whether it is the caffeine which is truly causing the anxiety or it is another thing entirely. So that's the essence of always making sure that there's a control group in your experiment. All right. Then another key thing when it comes to conducting experiment is randomization. Randomization has to do with you. We have two types of randomization. We have random selection and random assignment. With random selection, it means that you, you selecting your participants. You are supposed to, maybe I selected, I want, I want, um, my focus is on conducting a study among maybe um, distance students. And I want 10 students. So the random selection will come in whereby I'll use coin tossing to select the 10 participants. Or I'll do balloting to select only 10 participants for the study. So that's random selection. After you've selected your 10 participants, you're supposed to also do something known as random assignment, whereby you assign your participants into either a control or experimental group. Experimental group is the same as treatment group. So the 10 participants that I have selected, I'll use the same coin tossing or balloting to select some of the participants to be in control group and some to be in, in where? Treatment group. So that it wouldn't be like, I'll be the ones intentionally selecting who goes into experimental or who goes into treatment group. Because the moment you don't do random assignment by using balloting or coin tossing, or sometimes some people will use random generator to do it. If you don't do it in that way, it means that you, the researcher, you might be biased. It could be that, okay, some of the participants, you are familiar with them, or maybe you are using certain um, preconceived ideas to select your participants, or who you're using your preconceived ideas to select who will be in the treatment group or the control group. So it means you are supposed to give chance for balloting to happen so that your biases will be what will be reduced. So it means random assignment reduces experimental bias. Experimental bias has to do with how 
um, the researchers' um, preconceived ideas could affect the study. So you are trying to reduce that by using balloting or coin tossing or random generator to select your participant into treatment or control group. That's the essence. So please, it's really key for you to know the rationale behind everything, the rationale behind control group, the rationale behind randomization. And I hope it is clear. So if you have any clarification, there's a time for you to let me know. So if you have questions in the course of me having this, this discussion, you can raise up your hand, then I'll call you. Listen. Yeah, yes, sir. So I'm trying to picture what uh, you just said about um, the, the randomization. I'm trying to picture it out, but I still can't picture it out. If you could give an example, because I'm wondering how um, a, a participant could be randomly assigned and selected, because I, I, okay. to my... I've been doing this. Let me, you, no problem. I'll, I'll create one scenario right now. I'll be using random ge okay. generator. So I'll okay. screen share um, my browser so that you know, I hope you can all see. So I'm typing random generator. No, I don't want this one. So let's say I've already selected 10 participants, okay? So you can see that with, with the random generator, we have lower limit one, then the upper limit 10. So it means I have 10 participants in all. So I want to make sure that any of the participants who go into the treatment group or the control group. I hope you get it. Okay, so after you've selected a boundary one and 10, one to 10, you click on generate. So I'll say that, okay, the first number that pops up, that first number will be at the treatment group. Then the next number, the second number that pops up again will be at um, the control group. So when I click on generate, one was the one that came. So it means number one will be at the treatment group. So before you do this, hold on, before you do this, the 10 participants, give them numbers. So you can just, uh, uh, you have your 10 participants, you just indicate, okay, number one, two, three, up to 10. So each participant knows that, okay, I am number one or number two, number three. So then you use a random generator. The number that pops up, because the random generator is more or less like, it's to give you random numbers. So you just indicate that, okay, the first number that pops up, the person will be treatment group. Then the second number will be control group. So I click on generate. Number two just pop up. So it means number two will be for what? Treatment. Then the next number will generate. Number 10 will be where? For um, control group. Then the next number, number nine. Number nine will be for treatment. Number six will be for control group. So you do this until you get each participant to be in what? In a particular group. That's how you do it. So it means it gives you using the random gen generator prevents any biases. Because you don't want a situation whereby you be the one what? Moving the participants, intentionally moving the participants into control or experimental group. So you are using this random generator to do that so that your biases will be what will be reduced. That's the rationale behind it. So please, I hope you get it now. Yes, sir. All right. All right. All right. So please, any other question? In case um, you don't have any question, you can just um, lower your hand. So I could see two people, Vicent and Vivian. Vicent, do you have a question? All right, Vivian, please go ahead. Okay, hello, sir. Please, um, yeah. uh, the um, control group and the experimental group. So in this case, um, when you talk, when you spoke about the placebo, uh, um, the placebo is, um, they fall, they also fall under the, um, the experimental group, right? That's what I wanted to know. 
No, I said the placebo is under the control group. So with the placebo, is, it's like you are giving an alternative oh. drug. Okay, that's which is similar I, that's to which is similar to, okay. to the treatment effect that you pro you provided. Yeah. Yeah, I get that, but I wanted to know which side to place them. That's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're so welcome. they are the the group. Thank you. Yeah, Isaac, that's the last question. Okay, sir. Um, about the random assignments. Um, okay. What if, uh, let's say, you are conducting a test on marijuana? Okay. Um, would it not be wise to assign people who are already into marijuana into the um, experimental group and assign people who are not into marijuana into control group, or you still have to mix them? Good. I, so, it's it all boils down to the research, the type of research work that you are doing. So, for instance, if you realize that it is highly unethical for you to um give treatment to some people because it is unethical for you to allow people to smoke marijuana. So it means that you can't what you can't test that. So we normally call it. So what you just said is something known as quasi experiment, whereby we come to it later. So in most situations, it's not every experiment that it is ideal for you to um, have a treatment group and a control group. Sometimes if you realize that the experiment that you're doing, it is highly unethical, then it means it is essential for you to get an existing experimental group, which is there. Then you test them using your control group. So what the scenario that you created is a typical um, quasi experiment that we'll come to with later. Okay. So um, the next one is other effects and carryover effects. Um, I don't know why this this came this slide came here, because in most situations this normally happens when you are doing um, within group study. So for now, I wouldn't um, highlight on it too much until we we we, we have done something. But one thing you should know is that with other effects, it has to do with, um, no, I wouldn't, clar I wouldn't clarify on this or else to confuse you for the meantime until we are, we are doing um, within group study. That would be much more better. So please, um, let's hold on, on to the other effect and the carryover effect and counterbalancing. We'll come to it later when we are doing within group study and between group study. So the next one, has to do with the various types of experiment that we have. We have different types of experiment. And the first one is lab or controlled experiment. Lab or controlled experiment. So in lab experiment, we make sure that we, we control or reduce a lot of extraneous variables, a lot, a lot of them. So for instance, um, let's say I want to conduct a study to find out how music affects memory. Music affects memory. And I want to do it in a lab experiment. Within a lab experiment, I'll control all forms of extraneous variables which could be in play. So for instance, I know for sure that, oh, music, um, noise could be a major fa factor. So what would I do? I'll make sure that our, um, the place will be, um, I'll use a soundproof area or room. Also, maybe the lights, could also play a role. So I'll make sure that, oh, the lighting system, everything is perfect. Yet at the same time, I'll make sure that um, the, the temperature in the room is conducive. All forms of what? All forms of things. So in most situations, when a lot of controls are done in an experiment, it makes the experiment to be too much artificial. So we call it ecological validity. There is low ecological validity, meaning that the experiment doesn't really reflect real life situation because in real life situation, we don't um, make sure that we control noise by okay being a soundproof environment. We don't ensure that okay we control um, light Whenever we are we are listening to music, we, we don't control certain things, most of them. 
So when we make it too much, or when we we what we control a lot of extraneous variables, it makes the experiment become too much artificial. Thus, it has low ecological validity, thereby leading to low generalizability. It means we can't generalize whatever outcome or information that we get from the experiment into real life situation. That's one limitation about lab experiments. Okay. So please, any question? All right, so the next one is field experiment. With field experiment, it is, we do it to compensate for the limitation in lab experiment. In a sense that we know with lab experiment, um, it is too much artificial. So in most situations, experimenters make sure that the experiment is done in the real, um, the real setting. So for instance, I want to find out how alcohol influences maybe um, people's mood. So what would I do? Instead of me selecting some participants in a lab experiment, make sure that I control for certain extraneous variables in, a, in that area, I'll go to maybe a club. Or, yes, a beer bar, right? And then study these participants, the cost of them taking alcohol without letting them know that, okay, I'm studying them. So that's a typical experiment that I'm doing. But this time around, I'm going to the field itself. That's the club where people are taking what, a lot of alcohol and conducting experiments in there. So when it happens like that, then it means you are making sure that things are playing the way it should be. The, the setting is, is more or less like a real life setting. So we normally see that in this, there's high ecological validity. That's one major strength. And one thing is it reduces demand characteristics in the sense that the people in there, they wouldn't know for sure that, okay, you are at, you are, um, observing their behaviors or you're conducting any experiment. So it means they wouldn't be able to guess the hypothesis or the aim of your study, which makes it quite better as compared to lab experiments. So one major limitation is that when there's no control of extraneous variables, it could reduce the validity of, of the experiment that you are doing in the sense that we wouldn't know for sure whether it is the alcohol which is causing them to be anxious or maybe the room temperature that they are in is really, really not conducive or there's too much noise, there's too much distraction in the club which is causing them to be anxious and all that. So you wouldn't know for sure whether there are other third variables that are influencing their, their behaviors, that's their mood or not. So these are some of the um, limitations when it comes to field experiments. So please, any questions so far? Vivian, I have Hello. Um, some few minutes. Oh. So I think I would end the discussion here. So um, I'm opening the floor for questions. So if you have any questions, this is the opportunity time for you to. Okay, so I up. wanted to ask that. With a field experiment, with a national national geography we watch, whereby you see they will set a camera there and they'll be watching the activities, let's say, of a lion, studying the activity for a, or activities of a lion in his natural environment. Yeah. And meet him this field experiment. If in that regard, with the experiment that they are doing, they make sure that they um selected some um they manipulated one or two things. When I say manipulated, they ensure that there were some experimental groups and control groups, then fine. But in, in your case, what you're saying, it could be ethical uh, naturalistic observation. You're just observing their behavior, not conducting a, a real experiment. Okay, okay. Although they are okay, in their okay. natural setting, so they are just observing their behavior. 
with our conduct. So we, we'll come to that. We'll, find, we'll try and um, know the difference between experiment, observations, and survey. So remember okay. I said with experiment, in any experiment, there should be a control group and what? And an experimental group. You're supposed to do some randomization and all that. Okay. So if they are able to do it, then fine. By in observing wildlife animals, there's no way you can do an experiment in there. You are just observing their behaviors. So it, it will be a typical naturalistic observation. Okay. And also uh, with a with a laboratory and controlled experiments, we're seeing okay. something that it's it's the setting is more of at um at special. Yeah. Yeah, and you are saying that um in this case um you can't oh I made it I wrote something down <laughs> forgot my question. You said the training of variables are well controlled. Eh? Yeah. Uh -huh. So how do you control them? Is it because you've created a certain a certain um, environment for them so you're able to prevent them? Or something? that's what I wanted to get. Yeah. One thing is with um lab experiment, the rationale is that you've been able to find out that, oh, there are a lot of extraneous variables that could, that could affect your, your study or experiment. So you are making all effort to control everything. So the, the topic that I use, the experiment that I, I use, how music affects memory. You know for sure that there are certain variables which could easily affect memory. So for instance, maybe um, noise. Could affect it, the light could affect the person's memory, the um, room temperature. So you are making all effort to eliminate or reduce these um, variables. It affects on memory. So when you control too much of these variables, then it means that you are not giving room for the thing to be what to be real. Because in real life situations, we don't control most of these things. So when you control a lot of um, these um, variables, it makes whatever experiment that you are doing too artificial. That's, we have a term in research for it. That's low, it has, that means your research has low ecological validity. Okay. Yeah. So that's what it's all about. Christy? Good morning, sir, once again. Good morning. So you said, uh, concerning the experiment on alcohol, you said we can go to the club and who yeah. then will be our control group and the extraneous variables? Who will they be? Can we tell them that those drunk will be our control group and those who are not drunk? Exactly. Who are not exactly. Because you, are doing the room, you don't want them to know it is more or less like a covert um, experiment that you are doing. So it means yes, you wouldn't, you yourself wouldn't do any randomization or whatsoever. Okay. So okay. in your mind, you know those who are drinking the alcohol and those who are not drinking because definitely those who go to the club, it's not all of them that will drink, will take any alcohol. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yes, so you try to what yes, you try sir. to compare them and find out their moods. Okay. Or okay. what you can do is that after you have 